Good morning, good evening, good uh, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, this is our last Bicep Community Call of the year. Um, so pretty excited. It'll be some good announcements. Um, looks like it's a smaller group here today, which is great. So we can acknowledge everyone's questions. As always, um, ask your questions in chat. We have a whole team responding to questions. However, at the end, there's a Q&A. So if you want to talk to us directly, you'll have the chance to do that there. So our team is getting bigger. Um, you guys met Uche last call, and we have some new additions to the team. Um, David Cho, if you want to introduce yourself, welcome to the team. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is David. Um, yeah, I recently joined Microsoft about uh, two months ago now. Um, yeah, I'm part of the BICEP team and deployments um, under Anthony Martin. And yeah, just happy to be on this team and excited to work with all of you guys. Thanks, David. We're super happy to work with you as well. Can't wait to see all the, um, all the things you do to help out BICEP. We also have Tarun Sankarneni. He is he has been working with us for a while, working on a lot of different tasks, um, and he spearheaded some of our um, the hackathons in which we created some things for Bicep. But you'll see that later on. Tarun, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey everyone, I'm Tarun. Uh, some of you may know me. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to work on Bicep and add uh, some smaller level features uh, such as like runtime validation, uh, module file path completions, two part resource completions, description hovers and uh, uh, telemetry for um, the the bicep to template conversion. So, um, great to see you all and make it to the slide. Thanks, Jane. We also have Felice Topatan. She is not here right now. She's in Istanbul, which it is in the middle of the night. So you'll meet her another time, hopefully. Um, our core maintainers, you know them. We share them every slide there in the call. Um, I'm very, very happy to work with them as well. So like I said, use the chat. We're all reading the chat. If you have questions, you could raise your hand, um, but wait until the end in which we'll have time to talk to you directly. What is a community call for? It's for you guys. We want to make sure you guys get all the announcements um, and all the time that you need to talk to us and talk to the team and work with us. All right, Alex. OK, uh, hi, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving if you celebrate it and Merry almost Christmas if you celebrate that or happy Hanukkah if you're like me and celebrate Hanukkah. Um, going to talk a little bit about what our next release is going to look like. We're going to try to get this out before the end of the year and before we all leave, um, hopefully next week, um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, there's a bunch of things that have actually uh, come out um, that are in the main branch that you can try in the nightly builds. Um, the first is we have three new winter rules. Um, the first and third on that list, so use protected settings for command to execute and use a stable VM image. Uh, those are coming from the TTK, you may recognize those. So our goal is to get all the TTK rules into the BICEP winter um, and just have one less tool that you need to run. So you can know that if you pass the BICEP winter, you would pass all the TTK tests is what we're shooting for. Um, and then remove unnecessary depends on is a rule that we've wanted for a little while now. Every once in a while, we'll see depends on um, because people are used to that from ARM templates where they're actually not necessary because there's some uh, implicit reference between the two resources. So you can we can flag that now, which is pretty cool. Um, this next release is going to introduce something that we are calling directives. Uh, which from what I understand is a word that they use in other programming languages. Um, we're using it to start to suppress BICEP um, warnings. Uh, so what you'll be able to do is do uh, pound disable next line is all we're introducing at the beginning. And then you can put the name of the error code. In this case, it says BCP081, but you could also do the ones from the winter. Um, so if there's a, a warning for a type that is missing or something like that that you don't want to see on every 
uh, every time you build or deploy, you can explicitly disable those now, which is nice. Um, the next one, by the way, Anthony's going to demo all of this and show it off. Um, uh, we have completions for list star functions. So we recently introduced the ability, if you have a storage account, let's say, you can do STG dot uh, list keys, but we didn't help you. There was no IntelliSense. We didn't have any type information about that. Now, if you do STG dot, you'll see uh, all the relevant storage account list functions, and that's true of any relevant resource type. And we'll know what the returned object looks like. So we'll know that you can do dot uh, secret or dot keys, and that's an, it's an array. So that's just like a major, major quality of life improvement. That's pretty cool. Um, insert, insert resource. Um, Anthony kind of like casually did it on the side, and then I tweeted about it because I thought it was really cool, and everyone really liked it. Um, so Anthony was able to finish that. Uh, insert resource basically is kind of like an export, but all within the editor. Um, so you can just say insert resource, paste the resource ID, and we'll kind of uh, just insert that resource uh, body into the into the bicep file, which is pretty nice. Um, Sheng Wang uh, somehow always finds time to improve the visualizer. So there's some cool uh, improvements there to help you zoom in and out and lay things out nicely. Um, you can do go to def uh, by clicking on the resource, which is nice. Uh, and then we have new icons. We've actually gotten some external PRs for new icons. So you have more, the visualizer just looks better and you have the, the pretty icons that everybody wants to see. So that's nice. And then we converted to .NET 6 or we updated to .NET 6. Marcin took care of that. So the binaries are smaller and we'll, we'll have native M1 support, which we're pretty excited uh, about. Um, and there's other optimizations that we can do there. Um, there's other little things that I didn't have time to, to share, but, but there's a lot of good stuff to, to go get in the next release. Um, in terms of future releases, we've shared some of these details before, but we are updating the timelines because life has happened and, and that's what, what happens. Uh, the first is that 0.5 is probably gonna release towards the end of Jan. Uh, most recently, I think we said that this was gonna happen in November, um, but it's just taken us a little longer to, to get everything in place the way that we wanted to. Um, still, the main thing is gonna be the public registry, um, but because we've had to extend the timeline, we think that we'll be able to also finish the passing of resources between modules, which I know a lot of people are waiting for. Um, we have a, a PR with kind of the, the first steps towards getting this done um, that's in review right now. So hopefully we can make some progress uh, on this one. And then the next one, 1.0, we're pushing that out a little bit further. We're trying to give ourselves some more time on that. So we're tentatively thinking May, it doesn't mean that everything on this list will not come out until May, but we want that extra time to make sure that we have all the breaking changes done that we need to get done and that 1.0 is a really kind of like polished and, and finished release that you can use for some time. Um, so the things here haven't really changed. Um, uh, we'll still have a strict breaking change policy. We'll still have type updates that you can get outside of core compiler updates. So as new uh, resource types are released or new API versions, you'll just get those without necessarily needing to update BICEP. And then uh, we will have uh, some of these extensibility capabilities. I expect that we'll have some of that out in, in kind of an early preview or experimental preview so that you guys can get your hands on it in like February, March. But in order to really get things polished, like I said, we do want to give ourselves a little more time there. So those are the updates on upcoming releases. Okay, so I'm just going to gonna share. Oh, yeah. sorry, Stephanie, go ahead. No, I was going to ask if you want to take over. Yep, let me just share my screen. So I'm just going to share some of the, the features that will be upcoming in the next release, which, as Alex mentioned, should be in the next couple of weeks. Um, so let me just share my VS Code window. Can everyone see this okay? Yep. Cool. And is this an okay size, the font? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. So yeah, um, I'm just going to go through the, the the features that Alex talked about in order. So um, first of all, we have the, the, the three new linter rules. Um, we have protected settings for command to execute secrets. Um, this is quite a specific linter rule. It's looking at the custom script extension resource. And it's looking at this command to execute property. Um, 
So a, a possible pitfall that we see is passing secure properties to this command to execute property. Um, the, the problem with this approach is this is a resource. If you put this resource, someone else is able to read it back. And if you're putting secure properties into this particular field, um, it's possible that someone else could read it back and see your secure properties. Um, so in this example, I've commented out the secure decorator. This is all fine right now. Um, however, if I mark this parameter as secure, um, we now see the fact that you're passing something secure to the command to execute property. And we flag this as a warning. Um, and so to fix this, the, the custom script extension resource has a field called protected settings, which you can use for this instead. So that's that's what that lens rule is looking for. Um, the next lens rule, remove unnecessary depends on. Um, a common, a, another common like pitfall or, or, or thing to learn about BICEP is the fact that dependencies are inferred between resources. Um, so here we have two, two fairly common resources. We have the server farms resource and we have the sites resource. Um, if you're familiar with these two resources, you'll know that you have to deploy the sites resource after the server farm resource. Um, so in this case, I've put my depends on in here just to make sure that, that happens correctly. Um, however, there is an actual dependency between these resources. And so when you put that dependency in, when you when you essentially link this site to the server farm, you're actually you're actually creating a dependency that Bicep already understands here. Um, so we we now have this linter rule pop up and say you don't you have an unnecessary depends on entry. So I can simply delete that. And Bicep is, is just as happy because it understands this relationship between these resources. Okay, and then finally, the third linter rule that we've added is use stable VM images. Um, again, this is quite a specific linter rule. It's looking at this image reference field for the virtual machines resource type, and I think some of the other similar um, machine resource types. Um, and it's really just looking for this preview field here. It's just trying to warn you that you're taking a, you're taking a dependency on a preview field. Um, so we can make this one happy just by deleting preview and fixing to stable VM images instead. Cool. So those those are the th three new linter rules we've added. Um, the next feature to show off is this directive that uh, Bavier, who I think is on this call, has added recently. Um, so here I've got a variable. Um, we're seeing a warning because I've got it's unused. Like this variable isn't being consumed anywhere. Um, we've also got the concat function, and we have a linter rule to try and push people towards using or, or try and teach people about the string interpolation functionality. Um, but let's say in this case, I really just want to keep my concat. I want to I want to keep my unused variable. Um, we now have a code fix disable prefer interpolation. Um, if I select this code fix, we insert this directive disable next line. And this directive, this is brand new. This is basically saying. Um, Anything that any warnings that are raised on the next line of this particular code, just disable them and um, turn them off essentially. So up till now, the only way of really doing this is through your bicep config JSON file, um, which obviously, if you turn a linter rule off in there, you're turning off your whole project. Um, and this really allows you just to focus on particular areas that you want to disable the linter rule, but you may you may want it to apply generally to other parts of your code. Um, and then similarly here, I can also disable this one. So now, now Bicep is happy. There are no more warnings on these two fields because I've disabled them up here. Um, and then just to just to show off the completions as well that we've added. Um, so I can, if I type a hash, I get disable next line, show up as a completion. Um, and then if I hit a space, I see I see the individual options that are available on this line. So I can then select those this way as well. Okay, so that's that's the new disable next line directive we've added. Um, the next feature to show you is the the type validation we've added to list list functions. Um, up until now, you can you could use the list functions just fine, um, but you wouldn't get any completions for them. Bicep wouldn't understand the types of the things that they're returning or the types of the parameters they accept. Um, so so now, if I start typing storage dot, you can see we've got these suggestions for list account SAS, list keys, and list service SAS. And that's based on the that's based on the API definitions that each resource provider publishes. So if I select list keys, um, I can then do a dot on the return value, and we actually have descriptions that are coming from the API definitions, and we've got type information. So I can dot through these, 
I can pick my primary key, and then I can also see the available properties that are available here. So if I pick value, we now have our base64 encoded key. Um, and this also extends to some of the more complicated list functions, which I think have, have up till now have been a little bit difficult to work with. Um, so let's try a storage SAS account key. So if we do storage.list account SAS, um, I can look for completions. You're forced to pick an API version here. Um, and then we can take advantage of this required properties um, completion, which will actually fill out all of the required fields for this particular um, list function. So I can then tap through these, um, set them, and then access the account SAS token that this generates. Okay, the next the next one to show you is the insert resource command. Um, so you now have an available, you now have in the command palette um, a command called insert resource. If I run that, it's going to ask me for a resource ID. Um, if I paste my resource ID here, it's going to talk to Azure. It's going to get the resource body. It's going to normalize it by doing things like um, case conversion, removing read-only properties, and then it's going to paste it into my bicep document. Oh, OK. <laughs> I guess it's not. Let's try that again. There we go. Second time lucky, I guess. I'll take a look into what went wrong there. Um, so yeah, we have we have our resource definition. This is the bicep demo storage account, um, and it's fetched all of the properties that we have um, and stripped out some of the right only properties. So this just gives you, I like to think of it as a bit more of an interactive export experience. Rather than fetching a full template, you can be working within your existing bicep file and just fetch an individual resource. Okay, and then finally, the last thing just to show off are the visualizer improvements that Zhenglong has worked on. Um, so let's fire up the visualizer. Um, you'll see the, the familiar view of the resources that are in this file. Um, what's new is this palette on the right. You've got zoom in, zoom out. Um, and then you've got this fit function, which will fit um, everything in the visualizer back to the, back to the screen. So kind of just like res restore your default layout. Um, and then finally, if I mess this up a little bit, we've got this layout function, which then just kind of like restores order and makes everything nice again. So yeah, those were the those are the new pieces of functionality I wanted to just demo for everyone. Anthony, can you speak to the the algorithm for exporting and how it compares to port the portal export or the export API? Yeah, it's it's a much simpler algorithm. It really is just fetching a single resource. Um, I wanted to start there and see if there's a need for, for emulating the portal export, which is where we actually kind of go through all the children resources and also expect, export those. So it's really just doing a direct get against portal, uh, against the, the ARM API, um, fetching that resource body, normalizing the casing because there, there can be some inconsistency with different resource providers with the casing of property names and things like enum values. Um, and then it'll it'll strip out any properties that we understand as as not as read only. Cool. Anybody have any questions on any of the features that we saw or anything like that? Um, Marius asks if d does it work for all scopes. I assume that's the export piece. Yeah. So yeah, you can you can export resources at any scope. Um, it's much more challenging for the for the portal export because um, understanding all of the different untracked resources that are that are out there is difficult. But if you have a specific resource ID, it's a much simpler problem to solve. So so yeah, it will it'll work for tenant scope, management group scope, or subscription scope. Cool. Uh, when will these features be released? I, I think our goal is to get a release out before we all depart and hang out with Santa Claus. Uh, so hopefully in the next week to two weeks, we can get this out. Stephanie, do we, are you going to present more mm -hmm. slides or? Uh, John was going oh. to. Handing it over cool. to you, John. Thank and then you, I, everybody. Sorry, Sorry, John, I think 
Uche, if you're still here, I think Uche was wanting to get feedback on the directives, um, the disable next line piece. If does that seem sufficient for your disabling needs or uh, if there are other capabilities when it comes to disabling warnings or anything like that, we would definitely be interested to, to hear that. Yeah, basically to uh, go off of what Al was saying, if anyone in the chat has you know specific needs that come along the lines of the disables that they kind of run into, um, along the lines of a more, um, because yeah, you can always uh, disable the rule completely in the bicep config, but in terms of some granular focus on how you might want to disable rules without disabling the rules um, in the bicep config, is if anyone has any other specific uh, cases where they maybe want to disable, I don't know, a resource block or um, disable it just for a file or et cetera, then um, I would love to hear that in the chat. But yep, that's all I had to mention. Thanks, Uche. Thanks, Uche, and thanks, cool. Alex, for bringing that up. No worries. Right, on to John for bicep scenarios. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Um, so hi everybody. Uh, so we've been doing some work recently on the bicep documentation, um, both on Microsoft Learn and also on Azure Docs. And one of the things we've been focusing on is this thing we're now starting to call scenarios based documentation. So we know that there are some resource types that aren't very intuitive to deploy from bicep. Um, or, or from ARM templates for that matter. Um, so for example, there might be some aspects that trip a lot of customers up when they're trying to work with the resource types or they require some sort of um, base conceptual understanding of something to be able to, to work with it successfully. Um, or maybe there are just some tips and tricks that, that we can share uh, and that are helpful when you're working with particular types of resources. So just yesterday, uh, we published a new section in our documentation. I've just put the link in the chat and I'll share my screen in a second and, and walk through it. Um, and we're calling this, uh, as I said, scenarios. So I want to just talk through these because um, ultimately I'd like to ask your help uh, to, to identify additional scenarios. So I'm going to uh, walk through these and, and kind of explain what we're what we're trying to do here. So I'll just share my screen. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Can somebody confirm? Awesome. All right. So yeah, we've got this new scenarios uh, element down in the, in the docs here, um, and we've started off with three of the the, the scenarios that, that we've seen customers often uh, ask questions about or, or have some some challenges deploying. Um, so the first one is around access control. Um, so you can deploy and manage your your Azure. Uh, you know, role assignments and even custom role definitions through BICEP or through ARM templates. Uh, but there are quite a few things you need to understand to be able to do that successfully. So if you look at a role assignment, for example, the first thing you need to do is decide what scope you're going to put the role assignment at. Uh, and that, of course, requires that you understand the concept of scopes, which are an extension resources and so forth. So there's some some basic understanding there uh, as, before you even get to kind of you know what you exactly want to do. Um, then we've got to, we require that you give us a, a name for the role assignment. And unlike many role, uh, many resource names in Azure, uh, we require that this be a GUID, a globally unique identifier. And because of the way that this works, we, you need to provide a, a GUID that's going to be unique within the scope of your uh, subscription or resource group, but that's deterministic, right? And it can be quite challenging to actually build up a, a good, good GUID. So we've got some guidance here around exactly how you might do that and, and the, the pieces of the, the GUID function that you can, uh, or the seed values you can use to, to ensure that that works correctly. Um, then you've got to define to tell us which role to assign. And uh, if you're doing this in the portal, it's pretty easy. You can just kind of look through a, a list. But when you're doing this in, in any kind of infrastructure as code, uh, you have to work with a, a GUID, which is documented, but but not necessarily obvious. Um, and then you will not only have to work with the GUID, you actually have to give us a, a subscription scoped resource ID for that GUID. Um, and so again, there's a, a bit to know there about just exactly how to specify that for a role assignment. Uh, then you have to tell us a principle, right? So who's going to get the role assignment? Um, and so that's, uh, if it's a user, then it's going to be an object ID. If you're working with applications or service principles, then then it gets a bit more complex. Uh, managed identities give you give you another layer of complexity as well. So uh, again, it's it's not hard once you understand, but there's just some, some conceptual uh, understanding before you can really uh, be successful with this. 
So what we try to do is think through everything that somebody might need to know when they're deploying a role assignment and, and make sure that we've clearly explained it here. Um, and of course, if you know the if you know how to do this already, if you've got something to copy and paste, then you don't need this. But uh, but for anybody who's new to this resource type, hopefully that's going to be helpful. Um, we've done the similar kind of thing for uh, secrets. All right, so this is a very common question uh, we get asked around um, how do we uh, do things like manage our infrastructure as code with pipelines but then bootstrap secrets right if we've got some secrets that we need to get into our uh, bicep file in some form um, how do we do that uh, without having to put secrets in, in you know in places we shouldn't so we've got some general guidance here around things like you know using managed identities and, and other, uh, other other better practices we wherever possible uh, but then where you can't then we've kind of guided you through the things like the secure decorator um, and just linked out to the documentation for that. Um, talked about how if you've got um, uh, secrets that you, you're you pulling from one resource into another, then often it's better to just to reference those other resources directly rather than trying to copy secrets uh, through parameters. Uh, and then, of course, how to use Key Vault, and that includes the you know the, the Key Vault references and, and the BICEP uh, features you can use to, to, to work with those with modules. Um, and then the third page we've got is around virtual networks. Um, so these are something that a lot of customers create through BICEP or through, through infrastructure as code. Um, and, and one of the common things that trips a lot of customers up is how they configure subnets. There's actually two different ways to do this um, in, in the resource definition. Um, and essentially we, we recommend for, for the most part that you use the property on the on the virtual network to to to, uh, to create your subnets rather than creating child resources, um, and that's especially important when you're working with pipelines and, and other places where you're going to be redeploying the the uh, the bicep file repeatedly. Um, we've explained why we've we've made that recommendation. It's around the fact that there's essentially a a kind of a, a weird race condition, I guess you'd call it, um, uh, with how that works. Um, we're working on trying to resolve the underlying cause for that, but that's going to take some time. So in the meantime, we wanted to make sure that we've got um, we've got this documented as best we can. Uh, and but then of course, if you, you need to access resource IDs for that, then then you know we can help you use the bicep features like the existing keyword and, and nested resources to get those successfully. So we've got a whole bunch of material in here um, about those very specific scenarios. These aren't just general bicep uh, things. These are very specific to these resource types. So my request to you is if uh, if you have been working with bicep for a while, you've probably built up a whole bunch of, of knowledge about some of these types of things across lots of different resources. And we really love to know what they are because we want to make sure that we, we start filling out this section with, with more and more documentation. Uh, we've got some more in, 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 uh, already in, in progress uh, around things like you know deploying load balances, uh, public IP addresses that are associated with NICs are a common, uh, common one, uh, potentially app service and how that works as well. So there's a whole bunch of them, but I'd love to get your feedback. So I'll drop a link in the in the chat in a moment um, to a to a form that we've we've asked, we're going to ask if if you've got suggestions, please fill this out and let us know um, what what kind of things you've you've either struggled with yourself uh, or or what you've you've been able to figure out and and um, share that with others, uh, and then we'll turn that into to real documentation. I think that's all I've got. Back to you, Stephanie. There is yeah. one uh, comment. Uh, slash question yes. for Alex. Awesome. Uh, basically, this is great. It feels useful, but you're you're kind of you you always be kind of lagging, and that there's always going to be another scenario that you want to cover and that sort of thing, as mm -hmm. well as like when should we cover things in our documentation versus covering things in the relevant resource providers' documentation? Do you want to talk a little bit about how we're thinking about that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there is some work going on as far as documenting some of these same kinds of things in the resource provider documentation as well. So if you if you go through the uh, the documentation for a specific resource type, there'll probably be a, like a, an extra information or notes or something like that where we basically include some of this information or links to these pages. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. It's it's this isn't intended to be comprehensive and a, a guide to deploying every single resource in Azure. It's more these are the common things that we see either customers struggle with or uh, or that, that aren't obvious or that they could do with some extra uh, assistance. Um, but yeah, there, there, will, there will always be a place for things like, you know, samples and resource provider documentation, all those things. We're not trying to replace those. This is just for, for specific targeted scenarios. And I think, you know, some of those things kind of only manifest in BICEP when it comes to things like 
uh, uh, role assignment names, usually PowerShell or CLI is abstracting some of those details or Terraform will abstract some of those details where we don't. So mm -hmm. it can make sense to put it in the bicep documentation in certain cases. Yeah. Um, cool. And I've just put the link to the form in the chat as well. Perfect. All right, let me reshare my screen. Okay, cool. So I think this is the last item, but we wanted to give you a, a little bit of insight into what the public registry end to end experience is going to look like uh, to give you all an opportunity to scream now rather than at the end of January when we release it. Um, so want to talk through both what it's going to be like to consume modules from the registry as well as what the contribution experience is going to be, uh, at least at the beginning. Um, where it's going to be a little more restricted. So we, we can go to the next slide, Stephanie. Um, when it comes to consuming, um, I probably should have only put consuming on here to start, but that's OK. Mm -hmm. um, all the modules are going to be in a GitHub repo. So we're going to have either a dedicated repo or it might be a part of the Quick Starts repo where all of the designated public BICEP modules are going to live. And they will go through a CI process and a publishing process basically to make sure that they are of high quality to the extent that we can automate checks like that and has the right documentation and, and things of, of that nature. And that and it will get published eventually to MCR, Microsoft Container Registry. It's the exact same implementation as what we do with private registries and ACR, but because we're Microsoft, we're able to push content into MCR um, and make it available easily to you. Um, when you go and navigate for uh, to, to a particular module, uh, you'll land on a README that will detail, one is a code snippet of how to consume that module, as well as uh, as much detail as possible about the parameters and as much detail as possible about the uh, outputs. Um, so parameters will include any descriptions and any allowed values that were specified in the BICEP code. Um, as well as which parameters are required and which ones are optional and what default values they have. Uh, we'll, we're pretty confident we'll be able to auto-generate all of that, so we'll provide a little utility so that you can prepare all of this kind of documentation for, for a module. And you can use this for your own modules as well. So this will be useful not just for modules that are pushed to the public registry, but it should be easy to generate documentation for any module, whether it's public or private. Um, the third bullet, the default registry alias. So some of you may, who are using BICEP um, uh, module registries right now, uh, may be familiar with this alias concept that we've talked about on previous community calls. It's just a way of abstracting uh, more of the URL of the registry. What we're gonna do is have basically a registry that you can point to by default in any BICEP project. So you don't necessarily need to create a new BICEP config and point it to the public registry, it'll just be always uh, present. And if you want to disable it, you can disable it. But basically what you'll be able to do is br slash public and then colon and then the name of the module in the registry. So that's what a typical public module registry uh, reference would look like. And then um, on uh, any given module, you'll be able to see CI badges that tell you that it follows best practices and that it's deploying successfully to our test subscriptions and things like that. So you can have a reasonable understanding that, hey, this module is working as expected. I can consume it uh, right now. When it comes to contributing, uh, we are going to be strict at the beginning um, uh, in terms of only allowing contributions from uh, Microsoft FTEs. Um, basically, we just want to make sure that we have a good understanding of what the publishing pipeline looks like, what our expectations for good modules are, so on and so forth. So we're going to be strict at the beginning. 
Um, anybody will be able to submit a request for a module in the form of a GitHub issue. So they can say, I really want an AKS module and I wanted to do this, that, and the other thing. And we can take those requests and try to get them uh, built out. Um, but we won't be taking any PRs from non-Microsoft employees at the beginning. We will auto-close those PRs to the extent that we, we can. Um, uh, and we'll just kind of see how that goes at the beginning. Eventually, we do want to allow contributions from anyone. We want this to be a thriving ecosystem. We want this to be like NuGet or like NPM or anywhere where you consume kind of public content like this or Docker Hub for that matter. What we need, um, one of the things that we need is kind of a system for determining quality. Um, so we don't want to create just like a, a big list of, of thousands and thousands of modules where you don't know which ones are good and which ones are bad. So we need to come up with a way to have quality rankings or, or download counts or something to give you some uh, indication. Verified publishers, there's a lot of different things that we can do, but basically that's the reason why we don't want to allow contributions from everyone right at the beginning, but we do expect to have that eventually. Um, so just wanted to give you a little high level insight into roughly what the experience is going to be. Um, if you have any questions about that, there are a few issues on GitHub. Um, um, or we can obviously talk about it right now uh, or in the Q&A at the end. Um, and I'll stop and look at if there's any burning questions that we need to answer. Would there be autocomplete on the module version tags? I think eventually we would like to have uh, autocomplete on all those things, so it should be possible um, uh, to, to load all of that and, and provide you completions. Um, but we don't have it today. Um, and Uche asked if we'll support latest. Um, I think generally speaking, we try to avoid the concept of latest because we want you to pin yourself to a specific version so that, that we don't accidentally introduce breaking changes. Um, always willing to discuss more the, the concept of latest um, as well as other kind of ways to do auto version updates with semantic version and things like that but at least at the beginning uh, you'll be expected to pin to a specific version can we consume modules with wildcard that yeah that, that, that i think that's another option that we can consider um, and borrow that from semantic uh, uh, versioning concepts so that at least you can say hey give me the latest non-breaking change uh, or give me the latest patch version and, and things like that um, so Right now, we don't have anything for that, but it, it is all possible to build those sorts of systems out. We'll be able to generate markdown docs from templates locally without having to publish to a module registry. Uh, yes, the answer, Bailey, to your question is yes. So we're going to have some utility. Uh, I, it might ship with the BICEP CLI, it might ship separately, but you'll be able to point it to the entry point for your module, and we'll be able to generate um, a README with parameter and output details and, and things like that. So it, it should be pretty, pretty convenient for a lot of different use cases. Intelligent way to get the newest version. Um, there is not anything today. I think there are things that we can light up to allow you to upgrade or be notified that new versions exist, um, but, but nothing today. Docs for public private modules would like to be able to look at docs or have descriptions show up when consuming modules. Marius, are you talking about in the editor if I reference a module to be able to get some documentations inside of VS Code? Yeah, so when you consume a module, uh, you need to know about the parameters that are required, right? So how would we know um, when consuming either from a public or a private uh, registry, what what those parameters are going to be. Got it. Um, so when you reference a module, we actually effectively download a copy of it in a cache. And so we're able to tell you which properties are required and gave, basically give you the same IntelliSense and validation experience as if the module was directly in your, your project. Is that kind okay, of thank you're... you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the latest for the images. Marking deprecation. Uh, we actually were just talking about that this week. I think we'll ne need to provide some capacity to do that, but there's not a way to do that today. Uh, will we be able to fork the public repo to start a private repo? Absolutely. There's nothing we can do to stop you. So Godspeed. 
Um, and I think the other thing that's interesting here is um, ACR now has the ability to stand up completely public registries without any authentication whatsoever. Um, and we will support that in BICEP as well. So it might already be in, if it's not in this release, it'll probably be in the next release. Uh, where we'll support that new non-authentication authentication method, and you'll be able to stand up your own public registries. Um, it won't be auto-enabled or auto-configured the way the public registry will be able to, but you can stand up your own and manage it and, and, and tweet about it and do whatever you'd like. So that should open up some interesting possibilities uh, as well. If the registry is able to successfully deploy landing zones, using maybe tie it to whatever IP kit Microsoft Consulting is using for cloud projects. Brian, are you talking about deploying ALZ through the registry? Or I don't know if I'm totally following this one. And maybe we can discuss after. Uh, as well. Any other burning questions, comments, mm -hmm. thoughts? I see. Okay, got it. Interesting. Okay, cool. We can go on to the next slide. Um, so this, these are just some things that I think we ran over in the last community call. So these are things from the last call and this call that, that people had asked about. Uh, the first is the status of the Azure DevOps task. Um, so the question was about where are the DevOps task and GitHub action tasks for deploying BICEP. There is one for GitHub actions that exists. It's published by Microsoft. It's, it's officially official. Um, if there's features missing from that, we would definitely be interested in understanding that. We haven't heard any particular reports of that. It's been out for a while, so uh, uh, definitely let us know on that one. For the DevOps task, um, we we don't own that. We haven't ever historically maintained that one. I think we're hoping that that one would get updated by the team that owns it, um, but that hasn't happened yet. So we are uh, reaching out to that team to see if either they can figure out how to prioritize getting that updated to support BICEP, or if we need to contribute the PR, or if we need to take ownership of it. So we're working through some of those behind the scenes, and hopefully we'll have an update soon that we can share with you all on, on what the future of that, that task is. Um, there was a question on the last one about OCI registries besides ACR. So if you want to consume uh, BICEP content and push it to a registry that is not an Azure container registry, you want to use Artifactory or some of these others that are out there, Basically, the way this works is we use an SDK provided by the Azure Container Registry team, and it only knows how to talk to ACR. Uh, theoretically, we should be able to talk to any OCI compliant registry. Basically, the spec that we've implemented is generic, but we only have the SDK to talk to a specific type of registry. Um, so all of that, the, the, the short version of that is this is possible, but just not something that we can do uh, today. I think we'd all love to be able to support any OCI compliant registry. Um, and then there was a question about the check if resource exists um, function or the ask for that function. Um, the short answer is this, there's no update here. This is not something that we're planning to do unless something changes. Um, more often than not, the need for this ability to check if a resource is, exists is evidence of either a bad API implementation or a bad API design, that something should be tweaked and, and mm -hmm. the APIs are not being really thought of as declarative APIs, and it results in weird kind of maneuvering that you have to do in BICEP. Um, if enough cases come in and we know that they're never gonna mm -hmm. be solved and there's absolutely no way to fix this, we can certainly continue to talk about this function and see if this is something that we need. Um, so please do, uh, Anthony, thank you for putting a link in the chat. You can go to that issue and share your use case for why you need the ability to check if a resource exists. And that helps us build up a case internally where we can have a conversation with the powers that be that don't want this function uh, to see if uh, uh, we need it. Um, so that that is our ask on that one. Any questions, thoughts, concerns about that? 
Okay. Should we go to the next slide, Stephanie? Yeah, so for everyone who is here from a forwarded invite, you could sign up here um, to get the invite directly. And lastly, questions and answers. We have 15 minutes. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions asked in chat, but if anyone wants to raise their hand and ask us directly, please do. Uh, Marius has a question about the AAD or Microsoft Graph extension. So we've talked about extensibility for BICEP. Um, I would expect, so we're working on two providers um, for extensibility for BICEP. One is Kubernetes and one is Microsoft Graph. Um, I am expecting Kubernetes to land first, um, maybe February, maybe March, and then Graph to land sometime after that. Uh, tentatively March, possibly a little bit later. Um, so that should enable you to create service principles and groups and, and all those uh, sorts of things all within in BICEP, which we're pretty excited about, um, but there's a lot of moving parts to kind of get that right. There is a hand up. Philip? Yeah, hi everyone. I have a question regarding um, we often create uh, AKS servers with um, uh, BICEP. And when you do the um, what if commands after you created uh, the AKS, you have a lot of output regarding the Kubelet identity. I mean, I know it's dynamic, but I was wondering why it's always showing that it will modify it. I mean, the customers ask a lot of questions about it. So is there any way to work around this? So with what if there's a few things that can happen. Um, one that you can solve yourself if it's happening is if the value is a default value. So um, what ends up happening is if, 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 if there's a default value where you don't need to specify it and it'll get added on your behalf, what if doesn't always understand that um, if the API is not documented properly? Um, so if that's happening and saying, I'm going to delete this property because you didn't specify it, you can add it to your BICEP code and it won't show up in the what if response. If it's a property that is read only and generated as a result of the deployment, um, which I think the Kubelet identity is, and it's not marked as such as a read only property in their API specification, then you're unfortunately stuck um, because it, Basically, there's not enough knowledge out there for what if to latch on to to know that that's a read only property. The proper fix is for the AKS team to update their swagger specification and say this property is read only. So if it's not included, don't don't include it in the diff. Um, there's a lot of back end systems and processes for catching these things to the best of our ability. Um, and we try to route the requests that come in through the what if repo to the relevant team, but it's a difficult ask to prioritize to be totally transparent. Um, often it can result in breaking changes or things like that where the swagger was never correct, but because we generate all these clients and SDKs, if you change the swagger, it ends up being a breaking change. So it's, that's a lot of context to say that uh, unfortunately sometimes there will be what if noise um, and there's not anything immediately that you can do as an end user or we can do as the BICEP team. It usually ends up being a result of a swagger fix that the RP team needs needs to make. Um, and I will say, I know it, it doesn't always seem like it, but there's a lot more people on board with getting those swaggers fixed for real um, and putting in a real effort to, to doing that. Uh, I can't really say when that's going to happen, but there's a lot more people talking about it and a lot more people aware of it and understanding the degree of problems that it causes when it's wrong. Um, that's more than you asked about, Philip, but that's kind of the full context of of why that is the way that it is. So hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, uh, it was really great. So it was just about the dynamic part. So when the Qubit um, identity is created after the AKS is there. So mm -hmm. thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Kevin? Sure. Um, I hadn't got a chance to go look at the, the issues list yet to see if this is out there, but it's something I just ran into today. Um, would there be a possibility of being able to 
access nested resources as part of an object for for looping through them as as you create them. So like with a app service, um, being able to loop through like multiple slots that have been assigned to it. So if I need to assign a managed identity to multiple slots, um, I can't do it if it's a nested or a child resource of a parent app service. I have to have it on its own so I can loop through it later on. Um, would there be a possibility of us being able to access those child resources and loop through those at some point in the future maybe? Is the issue that you're uh, looping through the parent and wanting to loop through the child at the same time? Uh, I, I can't access the slot resources. They're not properties available to me in the app service. So if I try and go through, like the app service may have four slots on it or just like production and, and stage. Um, I have no way of looping through just the slots to assign them rights to say like a key vault. So I have to break them out as their own and they can't be a child resource anymore. So I can loop through them with a, a loop and an in index to be able to assign them the right rights to the key vault. I think, I mean, personally, I would need to look at some code to make sure I'm or, understanding it correctly. Um, I'll create I'm, an issue on it and I'll, I'll put in what, I'm, what I found I ran into. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. Sure. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns, clarifications? Marius has another question. Um, I don't know if you want to ask it directly. No mute. Yeah, sure. I, I can do. Uh, so it's on extensions again. Um, do you know if we will be able to create our own extension similar that we can do like with modules for PowerShell? Um, will there be a way to create our own extensions and interact with APIs? Um, for example, if we want to create one for GitHub or ADO, how will that um, work? I think as of now, we're not sure that we're ever going to do that. Uh, it is technically achievable, um, but it opens up a lot of questions and, uh, and, and managing an e ecosystem like that is not straightforward necessarily. Um, so what our plan right now is, is to get these two providers out and not commit to any other providers and just learn for a while. Um, we feel pretty good that these are going to be pretty useful, um, but we want to get a sense of how they're being used and what it's like to maintain them and all that sort of stuff. The next step, if we are feeling good about it, would be to um, add other first party providers. So things like key vault data plane or storage data plane or, or things like that where we can light up things or even github or, or devops we could potentially light up as a first party extension and if we feel really good about that uh we'll have a conversation of if we want to open it up to be something that anybody can contribute to um, so that's kind of the order of operations it's not to say no it'll never happen but i i wouldn't plan on it at this point basically Does that help, Marius? Yes, thank you. Cool. Um, and Marius, who shamelessly plugged, and I'll, I'll plug it as well, um, they're working on a, a pretty cool repo uh, they, that's called Resource Modules. They have a huge library of content there um, that was ARM templates. It's all been converted to, to BICEP at this point. Um, and they have CI that shows you that all the things are passing and all that sort of stuff. And they are designed to be um, generically useful, whereas uh, quick starts are kind of like, here's a, a code sample that just kind of works, but it's not meant to be part of your pipeline and used in production and, and stuff like that. Resource modules are designed to be generic, um, and so there's been a lot of uh, care and attention on, on that code and um, something that we're pretty excited about and see what people do with it. So go check it out. Any other questions? I, I had one more if I could uh, throw yeah. it out there. Um, is there is there any bit of work been done on being able to pass uh, full resource objects between modules? There is a PR out. Uh, it's not done, but if you're very eager to try it, you can try it. Um, you can okay. paste a link to it, but the short answer is it's not done. I think we want it to be, we're hoping it's part of the 0.5 release. 
that comes out sometime in January. Awesome. Uh, so the, the guy who's working on it, he he told me he has some focus time in December, so maybe he'll be able to to knock the rest of it out. Well, that sounds great. Glad we're working on it. Cool. Uh, Dushyant. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, first of all, great work, team. Uh, really impressive. It's really hard work, and thank you for that. Um, and uh, I was just looking at the contributing.md uh, in the repo. Uh, one thing is if if I haven't started it, but if I do get stuck with, say, something with the build or certain tests not working, is there a Discord channel or Teams channel where I can ask quick questions? Um, so you can reach out. We're pretty reachable. Uh, you have our emails from this Teams chat. Uh, so you can either send us an email or start a Teams conversation. Um, so we don't have a Discord, Discord but um, if you have any issues reaching us or anything like that, you can open up a discussion in the repo or anything like that. We're we're pretty engaged. Yeah, with, with discussions, we're, we're trying to keep those like pretty, you know, it, it's pretty like a pretty low barrier to, to, to starting a discussion. So like if, you know, even if you just have a sentence, you just want to ask a quick question, like feel free to put that in discussions and and other people will chime in. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last call. Four minutes. Okay. Uh, Stephanie, I'm not sure if do you have anything to to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing from me. I have a question. So, oh. Yeah, for those that are still on the call, can you paste what countries are y'all living in? Just really interested. I'm in USA. I'm in Seattle, Washington. I'm in USA. Oh, cool. Sometimes I want to be out of the USA, but right now I'm in the USA. <laughs> wow. This is so cool. Denmark, is Scotland, cool. Italy, UK, Texas. Australia, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway. It's crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. That just that just uh, made me smile. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> just where where a lot of folks are ca calling in from. And thanks so much for for joining, especially because I know time differences are crazy. So we really do appreciate that y'all just choose to come hang out with us. And hopefully we're we're gonna be delivering a lot of the stuff that you like and want. Um, and I think Dushyant just asked about time and can this be earlier? We're trying to alternate times. I think we did two in a row at this time. And I think starting next year, we'll alternate back and forth between what is for us on, on the West Coast, 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Um, so for the folks that are in, I think, Eastern Europe, I think that's who's hurt by this time. Uh, Mikolai can confirm that. Um, so we'll try. We're trying to bounce back and forth to to get everyone um, at least every other call. Um, and there are recordings. We put recordings up on our YouTube channel usually the next day. If you follow us on Twitter, you can get a link uh, to that. And we try to put it on our our GitHub issue uh, here as well. Um, with that, I mean, I think we usually end up uh, ending these community calls by just thanking all of you. Uche just thanked you. Um, it's been a crazy year. Uh, it's been just like wild to see all the usage and all the engagement in the community and the contributions and just it's it's way more than any of us expected. I think I've said that many times and it continues to be true. So um, we really just we really, really appreciate it. Um, and next year should be another exciting year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.